I read these verses um, tonight because uh, you'll see change from glory to glory by the Spirit. You know, I uh, I just felt over the past week that um, sometimes we as Christians can sort of we can sort of lose the, the whole plan of God for our life. We can lose the whole purpose of who we are. You know, we can just go through the motions and we can we can just feel like, well, this is it. Let's just get on with it, you know. But that was never what God planned. And I feel that when we're going through, just going through the motions of our Christian life, with no great vision, with no great expectancy, there's no, there's nothing welling up within our hearts. There's no great desire for anything. We're just, we're just going through the motions, just like maybe someone who's fed up with their job. They're maybe just going because they've got to pay their bills. You know, sometimes we can be like that coming to the house of God because we've maybe lost the vision. We've maybe lost whatever it might be. Somehow we've lost this attraction, this feeling. You know, ultimately it all comes down to love. You know, we've, we've, we've forgot who our first love was. We forget, we forgot, we forgot what God done for us. We forgot what Calvary was all about. We just forgot about it all. And then we end up, we get caught up with all the things of the world. Everything in the world is more important now than God. The, 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 thing, the places to go are more important than the house of God. The, the, the gathering with your friends is more important than coming to prayer meetings. Watching the television is more important than having prayer times with the Lord. All these things, you know, you're familiar with them. We all are. And that's, these are all signs that we've lost, as, as it were. Not lost it completely. If we're children of God, as I've mentioned often to you, you know what? God's got a big hand holding on to me. <laughs> and the same with you. His hand's holding on to you if you're a child of God. That's why Jesus says, you know, Jesus talks about his sheep and he says, None, nobody can pluck them out of my hand. But my father's greater than I. And nobody, nobody can pluck them out of my father's hand. Hallelujah. Double security. So even when we lose our first love, as it were, the Lord says, you might have lost your love for me, but I've not lost my love for you. Hallelujah. That's good, isn't it? That's, that's amazing. That's, that's what it is to be loved by God. And to know that his covenant of love cannot fail. But I just mention these things because this is the verse. Although I'm not actually be speaking from First Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians, but here it's a beautiful verse. Paul's speaking here about how the, the, the ministration of the law, there's a glory associated with it. You know, you know from the Old Testament, Moses came down from being in the presence of God and his face shone. But ultimately that, that, that glory that was on the face of Moses was going to be done away. There was a glory coming that was going to excel even the, even the glory that was on the face of Moses. Because that was the glory of the Old Covenant, as you know. But Jesus Christ came in to bring, a new, bring us into the new covenant. And this is the glory that Paul's speaking of here. This glory that excelleth. This glory that is greater. And that's sometimes what, what is missing from the Christian church today. We don't see much of the glory, do we? Do, do we? do we ever see a lot of the glory, really, in the Christian church today? Oh, there's some of it. There's some places in the, over the world where, the, where God's moving in power. Different parts of the world. Under persecution, you'll see the glory on the faces of Christians. But somehow we've got it easy. And whenever we get it too easy, the glory seems to depart. Because all of a sudden we've become familiar with these things. They're not important to us now. Instead of always realizing that it cost the Lord Jesus Christ. Cost him his life. Cost him, his, cost him everything to lay down his life that he might restore the glory and bring us to, into a greater glory, even the glory of the law. That's why Paul's saying here, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. 
Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So you'll see here, the title is Changed from Glory to Glory by the Spirit, and the an acrostic for the word spirit. And I'm going to look at the life of Paul, the Apostle Paul in this. And I'm going to look from Acts chapter 9, if you want to turn to that. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet th uh, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went uh, uh, against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. There's, there was the attitude of the apostle Paul, or Saul, as he was called. He wanted to. Bind all these Christians. Why? Why did he want to bind them? You know something? These Christians were having an impact. And Paul didn't like it. And Paul wanted to try and silence them. And that, you know what? That's what the devil's trying to do to the Christian church. He wants to bind the, the Christians. Put them in all sorts of bondage and troubles and problems. So they can take away their glory. But you know what? The New Testament church one day is easy to overcome sometimes as we might be because they had to throw them into prison Paul knew he had to bind these these shiners that's what the first letter is that, these, these, this first letter here and it's uh, first letter for spirit it's S for shined and verse 3 and as he journeyed he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined right around about him a light from heaven and you know brothers and sisters you'll know the day the light of God shone into your heart you know what you saw? You got a touch of the glory. That was a little touch of the glory when the, when the love of God touched your life. And ever since that, it's still, I'm sure as a, as a Christian, it's still there, still in your heart. You know the day you were saved, you were born again, and the light of God shined into your heart. Well, that's what happened to the Apostle Paul here in Acts chapter 9. Although he had started off his life, he was started off and he was caustic, he was critical of these people of the way, because he thought hey, they're doing contrary to me I'm, I'm a keeper of the law, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees, I'm doing everything and yet these people are saying they've got another way I'm not having that you know there was a man came to the open air last night and he was standing listening to Robert, and you know what he was he was a Pharisee he started, he started crit, being critical of what Robert was saying and he, he just don't know the law. He's, he keeps talking about the law. I says, what, 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 what point are you coming from? Why, why have you come with a critical spirit? And as soon as I said that, he walked away and started to get a conversation with somebody else. But you see these people, they just come up with a critical spirit and they want to try and bring, to pick faults and what people are saying or whatever. Not that Robert was saying anything wrong, but he thought he would pick something up and he would just, you know, just like a Pharisee when he stood before the Lord, listening for little things that they might pick him up on. And you see these people at times, they don't know the Lord, and yet they think they know God. Oh, they've got the letter. What did Paul say in that letter? The letter killeth. It's the spirit that giveth life. And you know, brothers and sisters, you'll meet people like that. They're no shining for Christ. They've got a legal spirit about them. And you know what? They hate anyone else who's got something other than what they've got because they think they've got it. And yet what they've got is death and legalism and bondage and a critical, horrible spirit. But they don't have the spirit of Christ. That's what Paul had until God saved them. And the light of God shone into his heart. And he says, what does he say over in Acts chapter 26 and verse 13? I'll just go through these points as quickly as I can. Although I could probably spend time on just one, one point, but at the end of the day, the, re the, reason I'm, the reason I'm going through these is to say to you, brothers and sisters, you know something? Don't lose the vision. Do not lose the vision for this church. Do not lose the vision, the ministry that you heard from our late pastor. Do not lose it, brothers and sisters, because I believe God's going to stir it all up again. I believe that. And I, I feel that. Oh, Lord, you know. I feel that in my heart. God's going to raise it up again. God's going to do something wonderful with it. 
Don't lose the vision, brothers and sisters. Don't let anything come in and try and silence or take away from what God has put in your heart. Don't let, don't let anything of this world come in or the things of this world to try and take away from what God has put in your heart through the ministry of a late pastor. And for those who are, who are just here at the church now, we pray that God will take the ministry that you're hearing now and, tell, and God will raise up a pastor who will take that ministry or take the ministry that God's going to give them and God's going to bless it to your hearts. But you know something? Oh, glory! I just feel that in my heart. God's going to do something absolutely amazing. That ministry wasn't just to be preached and to, to fall on deaf ears and for schisms to come in and this to come in and that to come in. It's too precious to God. It's too precious to God. And anybody who tramples these things underfoot or in any way, shape or form was used by a spirit of opposition to try and break these things up, God, they'll have to answer to God. But God will work out his purpose and his plan in this church. I believe that 100%. God's going to do it, brother. Isn't he, Jack? See, Jack's smiling because I know Jack believes it. And you know something? See, whenever we get a whole church who's got a vision for God, you know something? God will move. God will do something amazing. God doesn't need a lot. God just needs a handful of people who believe in the word of God, who believe the purposes of God for their life, who believe for revival, who believe that God's a God of his word, and God will do it. Look at, look at the books. Look at the great men of, of uh, past Miller, a man who believed God. See, when you believe God, God will bless you. God will give you a reward. God will give you the desire of your heart. That's why a late pastor got the ministry. Got because God realised that a man that he could trust with a ministry, and he was going to pay the cost for it. And uh, I've not even. I'm, uh, oh, what can I say to you? God is good. God is good. You know, Paul says in Acts chapter twenty-six. Acts chapter 26, let's just read a verse there. Yeah, sometimes the things of this world can come in. Acts 6 and, and th 26 and 13. This is, this is Paul speaking before King Agrippa. He said, At midday, O King, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me and when they were all fallen to the earth I heard a voice speaking unto me saying in the Hebrew tongue Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Don't worry about that, that just speaks of the cattle. They had these spikes when they, when they had to plough the field and to keep the cattle straight, they had these spikes. And the way they touched them, it kept them in a straight line. So really, that's all that's speaking about. Don't worry about the. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. See, Paul thought he was, Saul thought he was doing the work of God. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee, and for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things which and which shall appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, and to open the eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. But so that's what Paul says. I saw at midday a light above the light of the midday sun. And whenever you see something of that other world, that heavenly realm, guess what? It puts all the things of this world into shade. You see, when you see in the scriptures it speaks about the midday sun, what does that mean? If I said that to you tonight and said, write down in a bit of paper what that means to you, do you know what that means? Very simply, in a few words. All the things you can know about this world, all the things you can know about the heavens, the astronomical heavens, the earthly diversities of life, all the knowledge, all the books, all the David Attenboroughs in the world can tell you information. Well, you know something? See the light above the light of the midday sun? It's greater than it all. 
That's all the knowledge. See, you, you know, you go, on, go into, you go into your internet, you push the Google button. Guess what? That's the light that's under the sun. But you know what's in here? The light above the light of the midday sun. It's the light of glory. And that's what you've got to realise. All these, you know, they've got the oracles. Yes, what you do, you use Google, you go to YouTube, you do all that. That's what's under the sun. That's what's all coming, as it were, the wisdom of this world. But hallelujah, God's given us a wisdom that's greater than this world. That came from Jerusalem above. Hallelujah. And that's the light that Paul saw. That's the light that transformed his life. And you, you know something? You know, you know, what you're, you know what you're looking for? It's someone who knows what you're talking about. Because you can look down and you can see people. And you can see people's faces. But see when you see someone shining. Just like the word shined. See when you see someone shining. You're like, they know what I'm, ta they know what I'm talking about. She knows what I'm talking about. He knows what I'm talking about. You see, the pastor used to say many things, but you know something? Not everybody understood them. Not everybody understood what he was talking about. Why? Because you've got to get above the light of this, the sun of this world, the understanding and the knowledge of this world, and you've got to get into the realm of the glory that comes from Jerusalem above. It's only then in that world you start to understand what this is all about. And that's what happened to the Apostle Paul. Remember what it says, Psalm 15, verse 2. You know, maybe you've, maybe you've looked at this scripture. Psalm 15, verse 2. What it says, The mighty God, even the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to the going down thereof. You know, when I was, when I was writing this down, uh, when I was writing this down, these verses, I, I never I looked at the first verse, but I never, see I'm looking at it now and I'm saying from the rising of the sun, there you go, till the going down thereof, look, out of Zion the perfection of beauty God hath shined. You see there's a natural sun in this world, but you know something, you know what the psalmist is saying? God has shined from Zion, from a place above the midday sun, from a place above the natural realm. And it's from above the natural realm that we want to go tonight. I don't know about you. I don't want to be bound to this world tonight. I want to, I want to soar my spirit. I want to be free. I want to, I want to enter into the, into the spirit tonight. I don't want to be bound to this world. I want to be free. And it's a light above the light of the midday sun that sets you free. That liberates your spirit. You realize, oh, you, realize you don't belong to this world. You're not for this world. You don't belong here. People are critical of you. They pick faults in you. They, they, they say this about you. You know why? Because we don't belong here. We don't belong here, brothers and sisters. Get that into your head. You know something? This world will never understand you. That's why God brings us into a family. You know why? So that we can understand each other. You can have a fellowship with people who are of the same understanding. The same feelings, the same understanding in the word of God. You see, the Bible says, Paul says, the letter killeth. It's the spirit that giveth life. Hallelujah. That's all I need to say today. <laughs> the letter killeth. It's the spirit that giveth life. Are you in the spirit tonight? Because see if you are, your face will shine. And you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're not, you'll be sitting looking at your watch. You'll be fiddling. You'll be doing this. You'll be doing, you'll be doing all sorts of things. Because you're, you're not in the same place as the preacher. That's the way it works, brothers and sisters. And Paul knew that. Paul knew he was going to get a lot of opposition. Quickly, next to the, the next point preached. I'll need to obviously need but I'll, I'll just give you a verse Isaiah 42 and verse 6 you know when, when Jesus came he says I'm come to be a light to the Gentiles and that was something that God had picked Paul the Apostle Paul for something absolutely special 
Isaiah 42, verse 6, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. I will hold thine hand. There you go. I will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and to them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Do you feel you're in a prison tonight? You might be a Christian, and yet you can still feel a bondage in your heart. You can still feel a bondage. You know why? You're bound to the letter. You're bound to the letter. You can't get beyond the letter. You need your spirit to be quickened through the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden you feel a lightness. You feel, you feel a joy rising in your heart. Because now you've been taken from the dead letter as it were. And now you're entering into the reality of what the letter speaks of. And that can only be known through the power of the Holy Ghost. That can only be known through the spirit of liberty. Which is the spirit of the Lord. There's uh, other scriptures. I'll pass on to the next point preached, Acts 9 and 20. You know, when, when God saved the Apostle Paul, he made him a preacher of the gospel. Uh, he made him a preacher of the gospel, and in doing so, look, look what it says here in verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen, chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. That's something else I must say to you tonight. Do you know something? See, if you want to reign with Christ, you'll need to suffer with Christ. The New Testament church knew all about that. I mentioned in Friday night at the prayer meeting for revival that sometimes when we gather to pray for these things, do we really have an understanding of what these things mean? Do you know what revival means? Oh yeah, the glory comes down. But the suffering comes with it. Suffering and glory. It's right through the scriptures. Suffering and glory. Suffering and glory. Now look right away what happened to the Apostle Paul. Verse 20, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. And they all said, but that was the very thing that Paul was against. And all of a sudden he's turned round, now he's preaching that Jesus is the Son of God. And all that heard them were amazed and said, it's not this he that destroyed them which called on his name in Jerusalem and came thither for that intent that he might bring them bound into the chief, unto the chief priest. And it goes on to say that Paul preached right away that Jesus is the Son of God. Because what happened? What was the light from ab above the light of the midday sun? The revelation of Jesus. Who Jesus Christ was. And it penetrated right into his heart. And from that moment onwards, Paul was a changed man. He was now a preacher of the gospel. He was now, a, he was now one who would suffer and he would be persecuted for the preaching of the gospel. Ephesians chapter 3 tells us as well. So, if you're thinking of having a, if you think the Christian life is supposed to be an easy life, not according to this, this Bible, it's not. Not according to this Bible. The Christian life is supposed to be a, Christ, a life of, yes, glory, but suffering amidst the touches of glory. That's it. Do you want? Do you want that? Is that the life you want? You know, you think of the Christian. Think of think of the church, Christian church today. Just just think of it. Just quickly for a few moments. Think of the Christian church today. Think about it. It's all nice. People come on a Sunday morning. Oh yes, bring the children. In. It's all nice and comfortable. It's all nice and easy. There's nothing. No. There's nothing. You know. There's no persecution. Certainly not in this country. It's all nice and easy. There's nothing hard, not a lot of persecution. And guess what? Where's the spirit moving? He's not. Very few. But you get a church that's in persecution. And guess what? That's where the Holy Spirit's moving. Sufferings, that's what you'll get. You know, I've mentioned this before. You, you've got the, you've got the, the, the ability, if you've got internet, or if you've got any sort of access to the, the internet, you've got the ability to hear thousands upon thousands of sermons. Not always perfectly doctrinally correct, 
but thousands and thousands of sermons. You've got books. You've, you need to build new bookshelves to put your books on. You've got CDs. You've got these C think DVDs, whatever it is. You've got thousands of them. But where's the Holy Ghost? You see, we've got all of these things. But the most important one we need is the Holy Spirit. We've got the letter. But we don't have the Spirit to give us life. We've got all the things, all the access to all of these things. Look at all the, look at all the material that is available to you. You can sit and listen to sermons all night long. It'll never do you one bit of good unless you've got the Holy Ghost. Because as the Word of God says, what did Paul say in that scripture? You're changed from one image to another, or one stage of glory to another, by what? The letter? By the Spirit. So you can sit in a church for 30 years and hear good, good doctrinal preaching, good doctrinal word, and never be changed. You can sit in a church for 50 years, 100 years, and unless you've got the Holy Ghost, you'll never be changed. Oh, but that's a good church. They preach nice doctrinal words. Never do you one bit of good unless the Holy Spirit's working in your life. And you know something? How do you, do you feel the Holy Spirit working in your life right now? Because see if you don't ask the Holy Spirit, what's the problem is? What's the blockage? Why, why don't I feel you working in my life? I hear plenty of sermons. I hear plenty of things about the Word of God. But I'm not changed. You see, brothers and sisters, do you ever get sad if you're not changing? Do you ever get sad if you're not getting light on the Word of God? Personally, I'm talking about. You may get light coming from the preaching, but I'm talking about personally, your own personal experience of the Word. Your own experience of the Holy Ghost taking you to the Word and giving you light on the Word. Because then that's your own. It's not good enough just for the preacher to give you light on the word. You have to have your own light. All the ministry the late pastor preached. Thousands of sermons. Thousands. I think there was 5,000 all in. What did the pastor sometimes say? If you had taken all that on board, you'd be a spiritual giant. Eh? Why? Because it must be appropriated by the power of the Holy Ghost. Without the Holy Spirit, there's no growth. So Paul was a preacher, Ephesians 3 and 8. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And look what it says later on. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. All Paul's life was trials and problems, but he was a glory man. He came through it all because he was a man filled with the glory. And you know something? You'll be the same. If you shy away from trials all the time, you shy away from the challenges of the Word of God, you'll never grow. It's as simple as that. You've got to face up to these challenges that are facing you all the time. It might be challenges in your, in your family life, challenges in your work life, whatever it is. Unless you face up to those challenges and ask God to help you in them, otherwise you'll just keep getting round in circles, going nowhere, no change, year by year by year by year, and the Word of God makes no difference to you. You're still the same, still the same person. You've been in here two years, three years, five years, ten years. But you will not, you'll never not stand up and be counted and ask the Holy Spirit to help you in that situation. And you're going to apply this to your life. Then God will step in and take you from that place you've been in for a long time. In that rut, that spiritual rut. If you're not growing as a Christian, you're in a rut, brothers and sisters. We've got to get out of these ruts and say, Holy Spirit, reveal your truth to me. Reveal your power to me. Because I've been in a rut too long. Been in this situation too long. And you know what it says here of Paul in Acts chapter 9? It says, And Saul increased the more in strength. That's the next point. You see, Paul didn't shy away from trouble. Paul knew what he'd been called to. You know what I love? See, whenever, you know, I'm self employed, right? 
So are you Elizabeth? Do you get somebody to help you? Well, how would you like somebody to help you? And yet, but the heart's not in it. How would you like somebody to be helping you and you leave them to clean a room? Oh, you clean the bathroom and I'll clean the living room here. And then by the time you've cleaned all the living room, they're looking at their cell in the mirror. You know? Oh yeah, I forgot to, you know, check the, you know, check the makeup or whatever it is. If it's a guy, well, he could be checking his makeup. You know, you never know. You know, they're too busy, they're too busy about their appearance than they are about getting the job done. You know, sometimes that's what it's like in the Christian church. You know, you're like, oh, let's, I, I, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. The prayer meeting, oh, yeah, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do the next thing. Then you turn up and then they're not there. You know, what's going to happen? And we get, you get that all the time. You know, there's nothing worse when, you, when you're trying to get something done. But only, but only you're interested in getting it done. The other people, aren't they? They're all just, ah, having a wee blather, having a wee, you know. God says, that's not what I want in my church. I want people who are, who are here, who are here to put their, wheel, their, their shoulder to the wheel and want to get into this work and say, come on, let's build up this church by God's help. Let's get into the prayer meetings. Let's get into this and let's see what God can do. Let's get a hold of God. We can read it in the Word of God, how men got a hold of God, how women got a hold of God, how people got a hold of God. God sent revival. Well, hallelujah, let's do that. Let's see if God's going to send us a revival. Let's see if God's going to do something great. And that's the people God wants. It's nothing worse. You know, you're, you're, uh, you're working with somebody. You know, it's like um, Laurel and Hardy. You ever watch some of their sketches? You know, one's hodding up the end of the bit of wood, another one walks away, and the next minute, poof, then it falls, and they're tripping over and all, and they're, they're all falling all over the place. And, and no, they're, no, they're certainly not going to do anything. They actually end up wrecking the place, because they end up fighting and all sorts of things. And you know something, that's what the Christian church can be like, brothers and sisters. You can have a saint over there who, who loves the Lord and, and fire and prayer and desire to see God, and then you can have other saints who, you know, and God doesn't want that. God wants us all to be moving in one spirit, one faith, one Lord. It must be. Otherwise, we can't go anywhere. You get a football team, the, the football team's not functioning properly, 11 men on a pitch. And guess what? The goalies decided to go and get a cup of tea. And guess what? The other team's flying up the park. And they're all shouting like, ah, where are you? You know, hey, I've got thirsty, you know, I was away for a drink. They wouldn't last long, let's put it that way. That's just a silly il- illustration, I know. But you, you get that at times. People don't realise you're important. You're needed. But Paul realised that. Paul increased the more in strength. Why? And confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus. Sorry, I know I've not put the timer on. Uh, proving that this is the very Christ. You know what? See, when Paul's desire to glorify Christ, it pushed him on. And even, even later on in his life, Paul says in Philippians, isn't it? Beautiful statement. Beautiful statement in chapter 3. He says, uh, in verse... 12, not as though I had already attained. You know, people could have said to Paul, but Paul, you're a, you're a man of glory. Look at you. You're a man of great knowledge and understanding. You've got revelation. You've got angels visit you at times and storms. And you've got deliverances and all sorts of things. But Paul says, I've not arrived. He says, I've not arrived. I don't, I don't know it all. Either we're already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend for that which also I'm apprehended by Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I thank God for the people who have been here from the beginning of this church. Been here for 50 odd years. You know why they're still here? Because they're pressing toward the mark. They still believe that God's got a purpose and a plan for the life in Zion Baptist Church. And that should be encouraging to us. There's people getting here from the very beginning. 
quickly, Paul increased in strength. I've mentioned this to you. You know who else increased? Guess who needed strengthened? The Lord Jesus Christ himself. Remember over in Luke chapter 22. Obviously this was in his humanity. Luke uh, chapter 22. Remember what he says in verse 41. This is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. See, when you're in great trials and problems, but you're seeking to do God's will, God will strengthen you. God could strengthen you through a preacher by giving you a word from God. God could strengthen you just by you looking and reading the word of God and God giving you a rhema word to strengthen you in that difficulty, in that problem. If Jesus needed strengthened, the Apostle Paul needed strengthened. And you and I need strengthened. Paul speaks about that strengthening in Ephesians chapter 3. I've mentioned it before. Remember what he says in Ephesians 3? Because you'll never increase... You'll never increase unless you're prepared to decrease, first of all, through trials and problems. And then by the strengthening of the Holy Spirit, you're able to increase. Increase. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, I'll read this for you. He speaks about the, how the father of the families of the people of God. He goes on to say, For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. Brothers and sisters, are you growing as a Christian? Let me ask you that personally tonight. Are you growing as a Christian? Because you know something, see if you're not growing, you're not in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord says, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And I will let, bring the Father, me and the Father will come and dwell within you. Remember? What happens when all of these things start to take place? John 14. Why? You know what you start to get? Revelation from God. Revelation from God about your eternal destiny as a child of God. That's what happened to the Apostle Paul. God had to take him stage by stage and God knew that the problems he had God would need to come and visit him I, knew that, I know that the Holy Spirit's dwelling in us and the Holy Spirit's when dwelling in us we've got three divine persons operating within us but you know something you'll know I'm talking about having an experience of the Father giving you revelation on your sonship of the Holy Spirit giving you, remember it says in Matthew 11, no man knoweth the Son but the Father. And no man knoweth the Father but the Son, and to whom the Son will reveal him. See, unless you get in to that place where you're prepared to go through these difficulties and be able to come out the other side for God to give you revelation on your destiny as a child of God, you know what, you'll never grow. If you shy away from problems and never face up to them and say, right, I need to face up to this and get this sorted out, whatever it might be in my life, otherwise I'm not going to grow. I'm just going to be like Israel in the wilderness, going round in circles, never getting anywhere, and ended up dying in the wilderness instead of entering into the promised land and receiving the blessing of God. All of these things here are available to us. Revelations, the next point, Revelations, uh, Revelation, Galatians 1 and 12. How much time have we got left, Kenneth? Five minutes? About five minutes. Right. Paul says that the ministry he was given was given by revelation. What revelation have you had on the word of God and in your, in your life before God and your growth in the presence of God in the past year? Tell me, be honest with yourself. What revelation have you had from God? What any, any personal thing that God has done? That's spiritual growth, brothers and sisters. That only comes when you're prepared to go through. That's what happened to the Apostle Paul. 
watched what happened to him and his experience of the word of God. I know here he's speaking about him. God came and revealed the truth to him. He says, the gospel I receive is not after man, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. Because you'll know. See every revelation you've had from God. It's written in your heart. You don't forget it. It's not something you need to look and go, well, there it's there. Well, there it's there. Yes, you can look at it and say that's it in the Bible, but you know what? You know it's been written in your heart by the Holy Spirit. That's your spiritual growth. If you don't get these things, if you're not getting these things under the Word of God, ask the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you know something? The church is supposed to be going from one stage of glory unto another by the Spirit of the Lord. Um, remember what it says, remember the revelation that, Jesus, that God the Father gave to Peter? John mentioned it last week. Who do men say that I am? Men say that Jesus is many things. John mentioned that. You see programs about the true Jesus. The true Jesus. What they never told you about Jesus. You know, you see all these stupid programs. As if they know about Jesus Christ. There's only one person who can tell you the truth about Jesus Christ. And his name's the Holy Ghost. Not some program producer or somebody who thinks they've found some new revelation about Jesus Christ. Only one. And that's the Holy Ghost. And don't listen to anybody else but the Holy Ghost. Amen. Because they'll tell you a lot of lies. But the Holy Ghost will tell you the truth. Because he is the spirit of truth. You see all these things? Oh, did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? Aye, aye, I've heard about it. And it's not true. The Holy Spirit shows us about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be changing from one stage of glory unto another. I've mentioned this often to you. You know, I've mentioned this before to you. You know, I looked at, I, looked, I could mention the image from one stage of glory unto another. You see, see that image. See that that, that name of Yahweh up, up, up there in the pulpit. See, whenever you see that spiritually, that becomes an image. A supernatural image of who you are before God. That's if you, if you, that's if you, that's if you see it spiritually. Other than that, if you just see the letter of that, that will not do you any good. The letter of that in itself, yes, spells out the name. The Tetragrammaton, they call it. The word Yahweh. Well, they don't really know how it's pronounced, but... The yod, the hay, the vav, and the hay. That, seen spiritually through the eyes of your spirit, will, will, will show you the true image of what God's, God's looking to do in your life. Because it's, the, it's a new order of man through Jesus Christ. But if that just, there's a lot of letters up there, and that really doesn't mean much to you, you don't understand it. But if you understand what that means, spiritually, I'm not talking about, yeah, you can read it in the Bible, I am that I am. You can read all that. And that's the tetragrammaton. That's, that's to know the letter. But to know the spirit of that is to see who the Lord Jesus Christ is and to see what he was, why he came. Because one day God's going to present you. You see, I've mentioned this to you before. I'm just going to finish. I'm just going to finish. Do you ever look at that, that scripture up there when you come into the church? I'll, I'll challenge you with this very quickly. See this here, this, these, this, these letters. The wee yod at the end is ten, means ten, that's five for five, the, the, the hay. The valve's six, and the other hay is five. Well, see that there? That's a, that's a progression for you. Spiritual progression increase for you as a Christian. And you know what I want to say to you tonight? How far have you advanced along the name here? You start off with the law. You can't, you can't fulfill the law. Jesus Christ fulfilled it for you. And the first hay speaks about you being born again. Born again of the Spirit of Christ. But the second letter they speak about as a nail, something that joins. Right? What do you think that means? He 
You see, as a Christian, you've got to realize that you have the ability through Christ to join heaven and earth, to bring the reality of heaven down to earth and earth to heaven. That's what Jesus Christ was called. You know what he's called? The Son of Man. The ladder which was set up on the earth and reached right up to heaven. So how far along the, along the name have you came? Are you able to, to, to know that you're, you're born again? Are you able to know that you can, arise, you can rise in your prayer times? You can, you can get into heaven and bring the reality of heaven back down to earth? In your spirit? That's not the end of it. There's another letter. Because only then when you're able to do that... Being, being able to join heaven and earth through your spirit are you able then to have that other experience which is to be walking in the spirit there's now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the spirit but after the who walk not after the, after the flesh but after the spirit and that's what God's purpose and plan for you as a child of God is how far along this path have you reached as a child of God? Are you able to, 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 go, to, to bring that into reality? Remember the pastor done a beautiful wee image? Do you remember it? Have you forgotten all about it? He took the little yod and he made it the head. And then he done the, the next hay, the arms. Then he done the, 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 the valve was the torso. And then the next valve was the legs till we all come in the unity of the faith. Remember, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Unto a perfect man. You see, brothers and sisters, don't lose the vision. God's got a purpose for your life. He's got a purpose for my life. He's got a purpose for this church. Brothers and sisters, get a new vision. Get a new vision for your Christian life. Get a new vision for 2019. You know what? You're going to enter into that. You're going to know the fullness of that. And you know when you enter the fullness of that, you enter into the fullness of his blessing. And God will take you and use you. God could make you a preacher. God could use you in different ways. But God's got to take you and mould you and shape you into something beautiful. For his glory. Amen. I need to finish.